We have already, on a number of occasions, attempted to study the relationship of mind to consciousness. We hope in the present series to clarify this relationship a little more and to develop certain aspects of the subject which will have immediate and practical usefulness to us in daily living. As we probably all realize, in the course of the last century especially, the concept of mind has come to include the concept of consciousness. We regard these as almost identical terms. And while in certain departments of philosophy uh, there may be recognized differences, in practical daily experience we take it for, for granted that whatever we think about we experience as consciousness. We think of consciousness as that which gives us the power to think. And when we turn our attention, our mental attention, upon any subject, we assume that we are examining it in terms of our consciousness. What is the essential difference, then, in the meaning of the two thoughts or terms? In idealistic philosophy, and certainly in classical thinking, our consciousness implies participation as internal or experience analysis or value of an idea or circumstance. Thus, consciousness should enable us to say of something under consideration, this I know. Nothing prevents us from saying this when we do not know. But I want to call to mind the fact that correctly the term I know should very seldom be applied. It must, uh, the, such a term must be limited either to something entirely trite and of comparatively slight meaning or else it must be reserved for something so profound so deep an experience of consciousness that very few persons uh, can legitimately claim to possess it. To say I know means that we possess the fullness of the fact or the truth of a thing. To know it means to totally comprehend it. To know it means to know its motivations, its most secret thoughts and processes. To know it is to know its cause, its true substance, its origin, its procedure, its method, and its destiny. To know it is to be completely and fully aware of every aspect of it. Not only its outward and visible parts, but its inward and invisible parts. Under such conditions, the term I know would be very rarely applied. On the other hand, we can say this I think, this I believe, and thinking is a kind of of defense of believing. We think about things, but we do not think with them. By the use of the mind, we can become aware of such qualities and attributes of things as may be known by the senses. And to the sensory evidence, we add a believing, which is a distillation 
or an extension by mental process to an apperception of certain values beyond those most immediately apparent. Therefore, if we see with our sensory perception a man stepping off the corner of a street and walking toward the other side of the street. We then close our eyes so that we do not see him reach the other side of the street. We will still, however, by the extension of our sensory evidence, assume that he reaches the other side of the street and continue to visualize inwardly his advance toward what was obviously and evidently his original goal or purpose. Thus, by the mind, we not only see the visible parts of things, but we apprehend their probabilities. Thus, we gain the skill to estimate with certain prophetic skill uh, the ordinary expectancies with which we are surrounded and with which various activities are associated. We may therefore say that by the mind we may perceive the structures of things, their actions and conduct. And we may also reason or rationalize upon the meanings of things which are visible, thus developing a morality, an ethics, or even a philosophy, these being the extensions of things obvious and their uh, motions and certain probabilities derived therefrom. All through this process, however, we realize that thought is dependent upon sensory testimony. It is very difficult for an individual to think about anything of which he has heard nothing, seen nothing, nor which he has contacted in any way. Thus it is difficult, if not impossible, for a person born blind to estimate the significance of color differences or a person born deaf to estimate correctly total intervals. If, however, man has once possessed such power, but has lost memory, a mental power comes to his assistance, and he may revisualize or refine it such memories as are necessary to assist to interpret instruments when some faculties have been disabled and can no longer testify. Substantially, however, the mind is built upon observation and upon reflections about things observed. These reflections, particularly, because they become more or less abstract. And because we are rather proud, in fact, a little awed by our own reflective ability, these reflections may be mistaken for consciousness. It may be assumed that when we enter a reflective or meditative state, we escape from the normal processes of mind into some extrasensory dimension of knowing. However, this is not strictly the case. For what we usually call reflection is merely one of the numerous faculties available to us in the general structure of mental phenomena. As we are not yet able to adequately define the boundaries of mental activity, as we are not able to determine correctly what part of life is entirely mental and what part is without mind, if such a part exists. 
we are unable to clearly differentiate between the various sensory reflexes, nor can we be sure whether our mental activity is arising from thoughtfulness or from prejudice or from opinion or from a variety of secondary sources. We are told that man may say, I think, therefore I am. Another man will say, I am, therefore I think. And thought and human existence, a human state, have been regarded as closely associated. Yet whether thinking is a true evidence of humanity is still a moot question. For thinking has been indulged in since the beginning of history. Yet man has thought himself into more difficulties than he has ever thought his way out of. And when we become hopelessly involved in a situation from which no escape seems probable, we may almost certainly assume that we thought our way into it and arrived in a labyrinth in which finally our confusion uh, was no longer uh, dissolvable by any reasonable method. Then let us try to figure out how we shall determine the quality of mental activity. Each person can make a simple test for himself. You can sit down very quietly and say to yourself, I will now try to have an original thought. And after a little time of really great industry, we may come up with something that sort of impresses us that way. We can perhaps arrive at some adage or some phrase some neatly turned statement that so far as we know is not copied from anyone else. It probably is. Because the Chinese observed long ago that there was nothing new under the sun and the things haven't changed months in them, since then. We may, however, convince ourselves that we have been able to do something original. If we really feel this, then we should more carefully analyze. Have we really had an original thought? Or have we rationally extended a previous pattern of thinking? Usually this is the case. Thus in the patent office in Washington, there are thousands of patents which state themselves to be new and useful improvements upon something for one patent that claims to be an original idea. In fact, it becomes a very difficult problem even in the patent office to determine originality. And it is usually considered sufficient, so I am told, uh, to say that originality relating to a patent is the presentation of an application not already covered by a patent. It is assumed that it is original if someone else has not already patented it. This, of course, is, a obvious, is an obvious error. For most ideas arise from the extension of thinking from something already familiar toward a new or improved application of that principle. Psychologically, there are two sources of ideas which can arise in the mind and may seem to have an originality in them. One of these sources is nature itself, nature entirely separate from human achievement. 
For all human achievement has arisen as the result of man's reflection upon nature. The second source is man's own nature, particularly his body and its structure. For hundreds and thousands of devices which we now consider indispensable and for which we give great credit to early discoverers are merely adaptations of functions and processes of the human body adapted to some external usage. And we have discovered that there is a kind of analogy moving through nature. And because it was necessary for man as a metropolitan being to have a certain circulation and a certain great function of excretion. The study of this in man and its application to, solar, uh, to social structure resulted in the development of the great sewers and aqueducts of Rome. They were based directly upon the processes of the human body. Perhaps those who actually invented these devices or advanced them did not know this consciously, but because they had lived constantly in the presence of a universal ingenuity, in the presence of procedures, processes, and methodologies in the earth and in the sky and in nature around them, man finally uh, adapted and adopted these finding uses for them in the development of his own way of life. Explore experimentations with musical composition have revealed again and again that unconsciously nearly every great composer has appropriated fragments from the melodies of other composers. He does not even know this but he instinctively draws forth uh, these fragments and his contribution is not newness but a new arrangement or the, or the bringing together of parts previously not united. In other words, another way of saying new and useful improvements or the extension of some available idea further into application or specialization. From all this, we have to realize that mentation is a kind of exercise or activity upon a level. Mentation may expand to the corners of the world or extend into innumerable fields, but it is bound by a certain level of altitude. It cannot ascend beyond a certain point. And if it descends too far below this certain point, it also loses effectiveness. The mind, therefore, is an instrument adapted to the objectivity of human experience. Mind has as its primary purpose the victory by man over environment and the integration of his resources toward orientation in the objective world. The mind to accomplish this must have overtones. And of these overtones, perhaps some of the most significant are philosophy, religion, and science. And here we will come to considerable discussion, particularly in religion and philosophy. As yet, science has not come to this division, but it must ultimately do so, and we already begin to see indications of this division within the body of science. Ages ago, thousands of years ago, religion divided into a formal worship and a mystical worship. Dividing, therefore, 
the intellectual concept of religion from its spiritual or consciousness level. Philosophy did the same thing. Philosophy divided itself into an intellectual system of philosophy and a mystical or abstract system. Intellectual philosophy being represented by such works as those of Kant and Nietzsche and Schopenhauer and Hume and Lessing. Whereas the mystical aspects of philosophy are to be found in such oriental systems as Vedanta and Yoga, and in the western systems of Bailey, St. Martin, and Baron Emanuel Swedenborg. These represent divisions within a structure. Science must ultimately come to the same division, and there must be a separation within the structure of science to distinguish a materialistic or physical science and a spiritual or mystical science, using the same essential instruments, but one dealing with an invisible or superphysical sphere of causes, whereas the other is limited largely to a visible physical sphere of effects. This is because the inner life of man ultimately divides between an intellectual and a mystical approach uh, to the substance of knowing. Nearly all intellectualists are ultimately disillusioned. Uh, they plead the same sad story as Omar the tent maker, who engaged in great argument of this and that, but always came out by the same door wherein he went. The intellectual comes ultimately to the realization that the mind can go only a certain distance. From this, the individual tries to spread his wings by speculation and press the mind beyond the reason or beyond the fact towards the hoped-for truth. In a little time, however, this speculative instinct passes out of sober control. For as landmarks are lost, similarities and familiarities are left behind. The mind gradually ceases to have a functioning power of its own. Deprived of all cooperation from the sensory and reflective parts of itself the mind ultimately goes to sleep. It has no possibility of escaping into consciousness or departing from the world of phenomena to which it belongs, by which it was generated, and concerning which it is completely absorbed and dedicated. Buddha points this out very clearly, for he makes the mind to be a production of sensory reflex, that it is not the mind that makes man see the world, but it is the world which makes man have a mind to see with. And all of our sensory reflexes are totally dependent upon objectivity for their own existence. If there was nothing to see, the faculties of sight would fail. If there was nothing to hear, the faculties of hearing would fail. But there is a very interesting thing, a problem that has long been debated. The old story is, would there be any noise if there was no one to hear it? We may say definitely that if man did not hear sound, he would dwell in silence. Therefore, silence arises either from the end of outward sound or the termination of inward hearing. Either can produce the same result. 
According to the Buddhist concept, therefore, the ear and the thing heard are in indispensable relationships with each other. And hearing or sound is the product of their union. And if either be removed, the product is destroyed. If this is true of the entire mental nature, then mental phenomena generates the mind, which in turn reflects upon mental phenomena. Remove the mind and the mental phenomena ceases. Remove the mental phenomena and the mind ceases. They are utterly interrelated and interdependent one upon the other. The mystic, assuming this, has also assumed that it is quite easy for man in his search to overestimate the mind and by failing to understand the instrument to lose the skill to measure, weigh, and analyze the importance of its activities. We can never know how important thinking is unless we understand the process of thinking. We can never know whether we should follow our thoughts or not until we know how they are engendered, why they are generated, and the processes by which they are perpetuated and communicated. Thus, to accept the mind on faith is to accept the unknown, to accept our own thinking on faith may be foolhardy, and if we are badly trained to accept our own thinking may be a catastrophe from which we will not even recover. To achieve then a certain attitude of wisdom. We must realize early in our search for reality that our own thoughts are not important. That nothing is true because we think it is true. Nor is anything untrue because we do not think it is true. Believing is not knowing. Hoping is not knowing. And every procedure which arises in the process of mentation is no more valuable than the instrument that produced it, and no more significant than the level of action with which it is concerned. Man believing totally and completely in the importance of a material way of life will find thinking more valuable to maintain his concepts than a person who had a different concept of living itself. We live objectively in a world where thought and scheme and plot and plan are vital to our success. But they are vital only to our success in this dimension. They are vital only to the advancement of ends, which may or may not have any importance whatsoever in themselves. Usually they do not. But they are important because our own mind has told us that they are. And it is a brave man indeed who questions the profound thinking of himself. If, therefore, we wish to practically examine our own uh, problem. We must realize that we have lived always upon surfaces. This does not mean that we are content to do so. I saw some articles recently, a study of brain structure, which pointed out that man at the present time uses less than 20% of his potential brain surface uh, for processes of mentation. Also, it is noted that most of the thinking of man is now done on the surface areas of the brain, whereas it has been also pointed out that there is much reason to believe 
that it is possible to stimulate the thought processes in the dead areas of the brain. This may mean an interesting analogy. Man's surface thinking with the surface of his brain. The hope that sometime his thinking will deepen as he uses the dead parts of his own thinking equipment. In any event, we do think on surfaces. And whenever we become involved with a problem that requires grave thoughtfulness or decision or value, we're usually in trouble. We do, however, have an advantage uh, which in some ways compensates for numerous liabilities. I've heard this advantage advanced on many occasions. An individual uh, did a very bad job of thinking. But instead of being ashamed of it, he said, well, there's one thing the other fellow didn't do any better. Well, one of the things that saves us at the moment is that others are not doing it much better. It is not how well we are doing things, but that in the competitive procedure of living, our friends and associates and even our enemies are just about as inept at thinking as we are. Therefore, if we have one stray thought just a little better than theirs, we are on the way to victory. There is the old Spanish proverb, in the world of the blind, a one-eyed man is king. And in a world of those who think but little, even those who think badly have some advantages. Altogether, what saves us is our common stupidity. If the world, as Emerson points out, really let loose even a thinker, everything would be at hazard. However, presuming that the world did let loose the thinker, what would the answer be? All he could really do would be to organize the objective structures of things. He might produce a highly perfected and highly skilled blueprint for human conduct. But with all of this, he would probably be in the same position that man has always been in. Namely, he would require an army and a police force to enforce his own improvements. Because working with others who also think, he will find that every thought causes a reaction of antagonism from others. And as long as thinking is always on a level, and this level is objective, we are not going to have the integrities necessary to cause any problem to come to a proper and permanent solution. We're simply caught in the immaturity of our own perspective. Somewhere in this pattern of things, the so-called mental level the normal person of today is in the interval between childhood and adolescence. The motion picture industry has said that the average member of an audience is 12 years old mentally. I can't say that the film industry has done anything to help these youngsters to grow up. But at the same time, thinking even within the mental range, is still a comparatively neglected exercise. And we use the mind that we do have mostly to find excuses for the gratification of our prejudices and attitudes. Buddha points out that we usually exercise the intellect to defend the validity of our own mistakes. In other words, once having done something wrong, it becomes a matter of face saving. We cannot admit that we are wrong. 
And we find it, therefore, easier to try to force ourselves uh, to convince either our own lives or the lives of others that we are right and to develop ingenious methods for supporting mistakes or perpetuating them or making new mistakes to bolster them up until finally somewhere along the line the whole flimsy structure falls to pieces together. If then we begin to analyze our thinking even superficially, we realize that the mind is, has certain uses. That within the sphere of these uses, it is most vital, most important, and most helpful. But when expected to produce that which is not natural to it, or introduced to problems which are not reasonable for it, the mind uh, produces conclusions or findings which are deceptive and irrelevant. Mind, for instance, is very useful in memorizing telephone numbers, which are quite important to us. It also enables us to keep our appointments with reasonable punctuality if we can keep our minds on it. It also enables us to add up the multiplication table, to remember the things we learn in school. The mind also, perhaps, assists us to develop a strategy to protect our economic survival, or to anticipate the hazards which may come to us in business. The mind may encourage us to providence, uh, encourage us to certain frugality. It will also open to us another kind of memory, the memory of our race, and that is tradition. It will enable us to profit from the mistakes of the past, if we so desire. It will enable us to remember or memorize efficient methods which have come down to us as skills in trades or professions. Also, the mind will enable us, perhaps, through a series of symptoms, to diagnose an ailment with some degree of success. Although from the same group of symptoms, 20 doctors may come to 20 conclusions, all different. These conclusions, therefore, indicate that the doctor, with the same symptoms to consider, is an equation in his own diagnosis. And because of the specializations of his own mind, or the attitudes to which he is addicted, he colors even his ability to interpret a series of simple landmarks. Everywhere, therefore, we do observe that the mind colors and that in almost every procedure, we find the mind, to a measure, over-anxious to please us, desirous of coming to that conclusion which we expect or demand, attempting to prove what we want to prove, and to disprove what we do not want to prove. If we wish to regard a person as unpleasant, the mind will assist us in every way to ferret out every undesirable characteristic of that individual. If, on the other hand, we have a natural affinity to that person, the mind will then set to work resolutely and obscure every defect in them. It is as though the mind was a kind of yes-man, always arriving at the conclusion we demand of it. And to the degree that we do demand, the mind will be dishonest in our favor. And as this is what we wanted in the first place, we consider the mind admirable in every way and practically infallible, <laughs> simply because it arrives at the conclusion that we desire. It also has another wonderful ability to forget and when the conclusion proves to be wrong, the mind is able to escape all blame by transferring the injury to someone else or to some other time and some other place. 
and the individual just proven wrong will immediately start out on a new course of infallibles, never pausing to make any correction in the instrument resulting in the mistake. Thus the mind has an advantage that very few other persons or other qualities of life enjoy. The mind is the only instrument that we have which surpasses judgment on itself. Therefore, can always be found in an admirable state. We have no way of examining the mind except by the mind. So when we say to the mind, are you all right, the mind will certainly say yes. Or if we say to the mind, I do not like what you are doing, the mind will say, neither do I. It will always please us, it will always gratify us, and it will always lead us into further trouble. This in, ex in contradistinction to the general idea that we have that the mind is a noble leader of our living, that it has something resembling the qualities of a Cato or a Cicero, that it is fair and honorable, a mighty judge among judges, and that it sits aloof from all things, judging righteous judgment. <laughs> Nothing could be further from the case. The mind is in every mess we get into. It is a Mephisto, ever ready to gratify our every desire. And then when trouble does come, the mind looks perfectly blank and says, I have nothing to do with it. If the mind, then, is not behind all this conspiracy, what is? Behind the mind, undoubtedly, in the case of man, is what we call blind pressure. This blind pressure is simply emotional tension. It is intensity. Man says without thought, this I like, this I do not like. Whenever he sees anything, he says, this I want, if it is in any possible way useful to him. If he sees anything utterly objectionable, he says, this I do not want. And having, by the intensity of attitude, determined a course of procedure, he then turns the detail of the procedure over to the mind, the duty of which is to prove that he is right, to advance every purpose as he wishes it to be advanced, and to block every situation which he desires to have blocked. The mind, therefore, is actually the servant of the emotional intensity of the individual. The mind does not control emotion. The mind is the victim of emotional intensity. The emotions are much older than thought. The emotions rise in instinct and impulse, and these control and direct life, so that what we call living is largely mentally sustained impulse, or mentally sustained intensity. And by means of the mind, we try to find various ways of accomplishing our emotional purposes. Our emotional purposes of love or hate, of possession and loss of joy and sorrow. We give, therefore, to the mind the job of causing or making available to us joy. We give to the mind uh, the labor of taking from us sorrow. Therefore, we must rationalize ourselves into joy and out of sorrow even if we have to create a new universe to sustain our position. Actually, when it's all said and done, it is very hard to determine and to decide how best mind can be directed to its natural end. 
One point, of course, we learn again simply from observation and from the study of life around us. Individuals have a tendency to be more honorable when they are not under pressure. They have a tendency to be more honest when the advantages of dishonesty are fewer. They have a tendency to be more kind when unkindness is less profitable. Also, we observe, as Mohammed pointed out, that most individuals are probably born honest and are gradually educated out of it by their friends and relatives. Consequently, the greatest good that we can do for the mind is to release it from slavery to the ulterior impulses of our own emotions. If we can actually say to the mind, you are a learned counselor, I want your opinion, and I am not going to give you the slightest hint of how I want the episode to be interpreted. I'm not going to tell you what I want or how I want it. But this is the catch. All this conversation is itself arranged by the mind. Therefore, we have got to find a way of preventing the mind from knowing <laughs> that secret <laughs> by which the mind will be contaminated. We can say to ourselves, I... I, I want the mind to tell me honestly what kind of a person Joe is. Of course, I think he's a scum. <laughs> but I'm not going to let this influence my mind. This thing is done already. The moment he internally admits or assumes any attitude, the mind is already conditioned. And it is rare indeed to find a person who can come to a completely impersonal or impartial judgment on any subject that has any bearing upon his own affairs. This is why justice back in Egypt was blindfolded and the goddess Maya, who carried the scales of the balance, was represented without eyes. It was to indicate that appearances must have no effect upon judgment. And also, that we can only be just when we judge those things which have no profit in them for ourselves, and more than that, deal with subjects about which we have no preconception of any kind, and try to find an individual that meets that requirement. It is impossible, practically, to find a person today without preconceptions on almost every subject even though he may not personally be involved. He is victimized by the press, by propaganda, by news, by all kinds of conditioning factors. And he is highly conditioned by the opinions of the learned, the informed or experts, whom he regards, therefore, as suitable sources of information and upon whose opinions he builds. These people may be entirely wrong, but they become part of his basic mentation. Out of all of this, it becomes more and more evident as we proceed, and we could proceed much further, that the mind is a very mixed blessing, and that those who serve its impulses consistently are very mixed themselves, if not blessed. To recover from this, there has to be some solution, some way of breaking through this mental barrier. For out of the processes of the mind, operating under the pressure of the emotions and forming a closed corporation, not only does the individual come to false conclusions or inadequate conclusions, but he is blocked from any escape. He is locked ever more tightly within the mind. 
and he loses by degrees all perspective beyond the mental life itself. And as he cannot normally experience any internal state entirely separate from mind, he does not know what direction to turn in order to escape from this mental maze or labyrinth ruled over by his own ego, which is the part of him which must always be sustained and defended, and the intensities of which are the basis of nearly all of the psychic pressures from which he suffers. Out of this East and West, ancient and medieval, develops a great pattern of monasticism. Monasticism, which in itself probably is no real solution to the problem, seemed to be the best opportunity. If you wanted to escape from the dishonesty of attitudes, place yourself in a position or condition in which the profits from dishonesty were diminished. In other words, if you renounced the world, if you gave up your worldly goods, if you gave up your name, taking some religious name, meaningless to anyone else, and retired from the world and lived in a cave in the side of a hill, owning nothing, desiring nothing, possessing nothing, and dedicated perhaps only to the absolutely unselfish service of persons in need, with no thought of reward. Perhaps in this way, you could lower the pressure of desires. You could separate yourself from so many of the inducements to false thinking. You would find it perhaps easier to be impersonal, to be kind, to be fair, to be impartial especially if you added to this procedure a religious conviction, positing the love of God and the love of your brother man, and attempting in every way you could to remove from your life even the shreds and rudiments of prejudice. Under such conditions, you might be relieved from the tyranny of this mental situation. Many tried it, and there have always been a few persons who were by nature monastic, who were able to retire quietly from the world and serve useful destinies without the pressures of the personal problems which afflict most. On the other hand, this same escape toward monasticism produced a frightful harvest of neurotics, individuals whose intensities rose through frustration and who tried very hard to be better than they were and as a result destroyed their sanities and made possible some of the most mutilating episodes in the religious history of mankind. So here again there was no proof of a way out. But there was a principle involved. Namely, that honesty of thinking is in some way related to honesty of motives. That the individual who really and honestly wanted to be honest and had this desire basic within himself had certain advantages and could depend upon his mind to serve him more effectively that it would serve persons with less, uh, lesser standards of integrity. Consequently, uh, antiquity emphasized the importance of idealism, of gradually elevating through thought things which were most important to highest position and the state placing the contemplative life above the aggressive life, placing the life of wisdom above the life of barter, and also admitting 
But as man must earn his bread with the sweat of his brow, that it might be possible for him to maintain his economic status through reasonable indulgence in uh, economic endeavor, and at the same time have another life, a life to which he could escape at the end of the day, a life of beauty and of value, in which principles would have an opportunity to be strong against the pressures of prejudice. The division, therefore, of the life of man into an ideal inner life was regarded as useful inasmuch as it prevented the complete obscuration of ideals. It gave the person interior anchorage against the storms and tumults of the outer life. The entire concept, of course, was based finally upon the idea that when the sound and the fury passed, when the individual was able gradually, through the unfolding of his own abilities and his own standard of value, to relax away from inordinate pressures, he could gradually come to the state in which he would allow his mind to be honest. And each person can do this to some degree. I rather like some of the ideas of Buddha on this point also. He called attention to his disciples that it was not assumed that the average householder, the average student of the inner life, was to depart totally from all thought, leave the world behind and become an ascetic. This was not intended. This was only for those who had some strange karmic destiny that pressed them on to this, and also only for those for whom the way opened so that this could be accomplished without evil to others, neglect to responsibilities, or by setting an example detrimental to the character of others. Buddha did point out, however, that if the individual would make one small correction in any area where he now has a fault. This one small correction will so greatly change his life that he will see the true and complete proof of the importance of growth. And he will be inspired natural to such correction as is possible to him. The improvement of living comes not from merely contemplating perfection, but from the immediate achievement of some one small particular good thing, which in itself causes a general release of life from limitation or restriction. Assuming then that the mind can be given an opportunity to function, that it is not miseducated, that it is not perverted or corrupted by its own owner, that it is not given license to misrepresent itself, that a certain reasonable check is given by which the mind is itself disciplined to judge itself. He may have, as the Platonic philosophers pointed out, the way of educating the mind so that it gradually escapes from the pressure of desires and becomes a disciplined instrument of itself, capable of leading and protecting the body from such excesses of conduct as might be detrimental thereto. For man, then, from his very name, which in the ancient Hindu language, from manas, means the thinker, man, man is capable of educating the mind as he would bring up a child, until this mind finally becomes the simple instrument of humanity, by means of which man solves those problems which are essentially the problems of man, that he solves the mystery of health, of education, of labor, of policy, 
correcting crime and corruption, overcoming war and attaining peace. Therefore, that the mind is capable of correcting those ills which arise from the mind or from emotional tyranny over the mind. And by so correcting these ills, bringing man into a truly mental state, which is a state of order. Thus, a mind-directed society, if it is honorably directed, will be a smoothly running society. But the mind, so disciplined into order, becomes in itself a kind of restraint upon itself, and there is nothing that is less attractive to our contemplation than an intellectual world, a world run in an orderly way by a mental genius, acting as a superintendent over conduct, and perhaps even reaching the point in which its control is so great that man even loses the instinct to rebel against his own mind. This would produce the perfect archetypal intellectualist, the individual completely intellectually sufficient. But no one wants to be that person. Because, for one thing, something glamorous and beautiful is lost. Man really is almost like the Arab of the Arabian night. He would rather live glamorously than securely. He would rather have a dramatic existence with tragedy than a mediocre, monotonous one with perfect security. When it comes to actual living, man wishes glamour and drama. Now this wish also has a place in his total makeup. His emotional life, like his mental life, has demands. The demand of emotion is for beauty, for color, for drama. The redeemed, enlightened, or directed emotions must therefore have in them no longer hurtfulness, but a tremendous intensity of satisfaction through the contemplation of their own most worthy instincts and impulses the great musician, the great artist, is as important, if not more important, than the perfect intellectual. Now, the emotional life of man, coming into conflict with the mental, even on a very high level, we have two completely separate qualities. Qualities which on the level of thought and emotion do not and cannot comprehend each other. Mind can never experience emotion. And emotion can never experience thought. Man has a mysterious ability to experience the compound. But this is because there are dimensions within his nature which are not completely restricted by either mentation or emotion. If man was not in some way superior to both, he could not reconcile them in his own experience, nor could he share them and arbitrate them and mingle them almost as an alchemist might mingle the irreconcilable elements of fire and water. This brings us then to the next equation, and that is the relationship of the thought-emotion compound to something superior to and beyond itself. The Egyptians developed a very interesting philosophy by means of which they affirmed that all things can know or comprehend that which is less than themselves in the concatenation of universal order. But nothing can know that which is superior to itself. 
to know more than itself would require faculties greater than its own. To be more than he is, man must have become greater than he is. And you have the serious dilemma of trying to pick yourself up by your bootstraps or some other such uh, uh, inconsistent and unreasonable attitude. Therefore, if man possesses the power of consciousness, this power is not conferred by either mind or emotion. This power must have an existence apart from them. And if man is capable of reconciling thought and emotion, it is because in some way he is able to gain access to a power superior to thought and emotion, or to function upon a level above that of mind and intensity. The ancients held, therefore, that consciousness, which is the actual ability to participate in the experience of a thing, differs from mentation in one particular, that the mind approaches all things from the outside. Consciousness experiences all things inwardly, experiencing their inwardness with its own inwardness. Consequently, mind, like sensory perception, looks at. Consciousness looks into. And we are reminded, of course, of the familiar adage and statement made by the great uh, Jewish philosopher Rabbi Maimonides. Uh, this man pointed out that beneath the body which inhabits the garments is a soul, Beneath the soul or within the soul is a spirit. And he said this is also true of the law. For the body of the law is the Torah, within which is the Mishnah, or the soul of the law. And within this is the spirit of the law. And in all things, the letter of the law killeth, and the spirit of the law giveth life. Therefore, all things known inwardly become radiant or filled with light. All things known only outwardly are known by their appearances, their shapes, and the shells which conceal their true natures. Mind can intellectually recognize the existence of a life within bodies, but it cannot experience this. Emotions may feel or believe in the life within a body, but emotion of itself, untransformed and unregenerated, cannot experience this. Consequently, there has to be a dimension by means of which the experience of the inwardness of things and the universality of things may be available to man. The ancients, for the most part, assumed that consciousness, per se, was not a human attribute, that it was not a part of man, but that consciousness actually was the state of God. That what we call the divine nature differs from all lesser natures, inasmuch as the divine nature is the Noah, and subsists and exists according to the nature of being, having an essential substance, and having an eternal awareness of this essential substance. It 
does not necessarily follow that universal consciousness is aware of its own consciousness. Rather, we must assume that universal consciousness is an existing state, a kind of sea or ocean of life, that this consciousness pervades all things, that it is known only to itself, if at all, and that no other type of mentation or emotional cognizance can be directly aware of it except by judgment or rational extension. Thus the mind, as in the present moment while we are discussing together, is capable of assuming the existence of consciousness. It is capable also of fashioning an intellectual definition of consciousness. It is furthermore capable of rationalizing the absolute necessity for consciousness as the common substance and denominator of lesser states, the reconciler of all opposites and a state of unity or totality without which the universe itself could not endure. Mind can therefore tell us of this, and by negative definition can convince us and assure us, even to the point of our own acknowledgement, that such a condition does exist, and that there is a being according to essence in nature, and that this being is different from all inferior beings because it is more than they are. It is therefore more than time, or it is eternity. It is more than parts, therefore it is wholeness. It is more than divided knowledge, therefore it is wisdom. It is more than the numerous virtues, therefore it is the good. It is superior to nature, therefore it must be part of the cause which engenders or generates nature. It is greater than man, therefore it is divine. These conclusions we arrive at, and from these conclusions great rational philosophies and religions have been built. And these rational systems are not bad, nor are they necessarily corrupt from any such conclusion or belief. If corruption enters into them, it is because they have departed from value, not because they have affirmed something greater than themselves. Yet having achieved the intellectual recognition of all these things, Having, therefore, the intellectual recognition of divine love as an aspect of universal consciousness. Having the intellectual concept of divine wisdom as an expression of universal consciousness. Having also the intellectual concept of divine power as an aspect of universal consciousness. We come, therefore, into omniscience, omnipresence, and omniactivity. And we also can see that our ultimate allegiance is to this universal and supreme good, which our intellect seeks to embrace, and which our senses generate, clothing, however, always in the simpler terms of familiar things so that we actually must use comparatively commonplace expressions, and in inwardly reflecting upon these great matters, we use trite symbols which are utterly inadequate. Recognizing all this, we can then perhaps uh, understand the difference between consciousness and thought. For thought gives us the power to recognize all these good things. 
yet it does not give us a sharing in them. It does not cause these good things to awaken immediately within us. Nor does this thought fill us with such inevitable and ever-present admiration that we immediately depart from all else and strive after this sovereignty of good. Thus believing in universal love, we continue to hate our neighbors. Believing in universal peace, we continue to precipitate wars. Believing in universal tolerance, we are still subject to religious and racial intolerances. Believing in the value of all spiritual matters over material considerations, we still desperately strive after material ends at the expense of conscience and character. This is because we can think about good, but this thinking does not give us the living experience of good by which it becomes more important than any other consideration and by which it is made to exercise an irresistible force upon our conduct. The only answer then is that in order to be moved dynamically from a common and ordinary procedure to an uncommon and unordinary one, there has to be some kind of an impact. This impact for me, for man, must be an extraordinary circumstance. And such an extraordinary circumstance is usually an experience of consciousness arising from catastrophe, from crisis, or from some tremendous revolution within the temperament of the individual. The moment that an experience of consciousness takes pla the place of a mental concept, the individual becomes identical with his objective. He does not contemplate it, he is it. He is not given any longer the privilege of deciding which is better. For in the experience of the best, all else becomes unimportant. Consequently, our deepest philosophies have always impelled man to search for the experience of consciousness by means of which a totality or a synthesis takes the place of a fragmentary knowledge or an analytical approach to truth. Consciousness, by the very experience which man has occasionally been able to record concerning it, is not something of particulars. Consciousness does not fill up the deficiencies of reason, nor does it necessarily bestow skill where aptitudes have not been properly cultivated. For the most part, consciousness is an impact of total value. And this impact is such that it can vitalize or sustain almost any kind of particular effort. We have no way of knowing whether what is termed the mystical experience differs with different types of persons. We wonder if the experience which comes to a scientist is different from that which comes to a monk in the desert. Is the mystical experience thereby conditioned uh, to the intellectual background of the person receiving it? This seems doubtful for the reason that this experience is nearly always conferred under conditions which all classes of society have in common. For example, the businessman with the dying child has something in common with the prince of the realm with a dying child, or a savage in the jungle 
with a dying child. It is this common tragedy that unlocks something in the individual which is a common denominator of conscious experience. It is not so much the particular attainments of the individual that seem to lure him toward the mystical consciousness experience. It is a common need, and a need for simple things that we all need. Einstein pointed out that the great mathematician is in just the same need for a simple consolation of spirit as the priest or the mystic. And if a mystical experience comes, it comes on the level of the need, not on the level of the attainment. It is therefore the common sorrow of man, the common stress of existence, the common hunger of hearts and souls that appears to be the thing that opens the door of conscious experience as distinguished from mental endeavor. For in most instances, this experience does not come until the possibility of mental satisfaction or condolence has been exhausted. It only comes when the individual can no longer find solace, either in thought or in reason. But breaking down into the simplest parts of his humanity, strives after that which is the common consolation with all that lives. The sage, the saint, and the commoner are all united in these immediate pressing needs. And therefore, it is by the common denominator of such needs that consciousness, the common denominator of all life, symbolically reveals itself. But in consciousness, there is the bestowal of a certain kind of certainty. And we must ask ourselves just exactly what kind of certainty this is. We know it is not a theological certainty in the common sense of the word. It does not belong to a faith. For the mystical experience has occurred in all religions. It has therefore to do with the quality of believing rather than the creed. This is another, is another example of how it breaks away from intellectualism. For many creeds are divided intellectually, but the soul hungers of human beings are not so easily divided. It is the hunger in the heart of man, the hunger of life, as Bailey calls it, the hunger of the creature for the creator that seems to be the final appetite by means of which the individual crosses into that causal kind of knowing which alone satisfies the hunger that food cannot reach. Man requiring this bread which is not of this world, this bread which is the food of the spirit, gains his insight and consciousness by the hunger of his needing rather than by the intellectual requirements of his mind. He is actually not searching for proof, for as one mystic points out, he was not seeking to justify God or to know that God existed or to prove God. He was simply seeking this peace which surpasseth understanding. He was seeking inevitably for this life which is indeed the life of men, the life of conscious experience within. For without this, all is death once man has recognized the possibility of its attainment. So consciousness to these mystics is not something over which man may exercise any control. The 
the hour of its coming no man knoweth. For it entereth as a thief in the night. The individual cannot earn it exactly. He may merit it. He may deserve it. But its coming depends upon a basis of merit and desert beyond our estimation. And the mind which considers itself ready may be deceiving both itself and the heart. It is therefore in the readiness of the pure life in man that the experience comes, not in the justification by the mind or the emotion. In this experience, therefore, man's experience of consciousness is not that he becomes conscious, but rather that he enters into a subjective state of total worship, that he is suddenly aware of something that brings him to his knees, inwardly if not outwardly. He is not brought to his knees by terror or by fear, but by the awesomeness of that which is inevitably and eternally so. He enters into a highly receptive relationship. Suddenly, with all of his total life, his total being, he is able to say, not my will, but thine be done. Because in this case, his own will ceases to be of any value, any significance or any importance. In fact, it is a detriment. It is part of that thing which has forced the mind against the wisdom of the heart. It is, therefore, the willlessness of the total acceptance in which the individual, opening himself, becomes entirely receptive to that which was, is, and ever shall be. Thus consciousness, moving into man, takes the place of man in his own nature. And this consciousness becomes a strange, ever-living sharing. It is that something by which a light from within shining upon all other things, causes these other things to appear transparent, causes their inner parts to be as evident as their outer parts, but mostly transparent in their causes, in their spirits, and in the source and substance of their motivations. Thus universal consciousness, as St. Francis of Assisi points out, bestows with it universal compassion. The individual ceases forever to judge because judgment was a mind-judging life. This is audacity, only permissible while man knows no better. But with mind judges life and comes in with an unhappy verdict, life judges life and comes in with a verdict of divine love and understanding. Life judging itself knows itself. Knows therefore its risings up and its settings down. Knows its increasing and its decreasing. And the life of the universe, being the love of God, knows the shortcoming limitation and frustration of all creatures that have not come to the light. Therefore it passes judgment upon nothing, but rejoices in the light within all other things. And moving toward consciousness, move towards a unity in which there is no longer diversity and no longer mine or thine. Thus in the mystical experience, all desire to pass judgment is lost. And the individual has this momentary flash of eternity, as described by Bailey as the lightning flash, 
which suddenly and instantly illumines all things, then passes, leaving a darkness. But that darkness can never forget the light. And that which is seen in the moment of light forever destroys man's fear of darkness. For in a moment he has seen what is in the darkness, and he has seen that it is good. And in this goodness is the end of all his fearing. Plotinus declares that on only a few occasions was he lifted up into the blessed experience of his God. But in those moments, he was as God. And being as God, he became as father, mother, child. He became parent and friend. He became leader and lover, all in one. And in the moments that followed these experiences, when life closed in again upon the mundane pattern of things, Plotinus said that these moments of eternity sustain the soul throughout the whole mystery of time. Once this experience has occurred, a man has, know, has the knowing and can say of inward things, these I know. Again, such an one, the shocks and arrows of outrageous fortune have no power or strength. And although the light itself may not continue to shine, man continues to know that it is there, separated from him only by the opacity of his own senses. And that wherever he sees darkness, it is merely because his eyes cannot bear the light that is behind the darkness. Thus in these experiences come, comes to man the courage or the strength to sustain him through the numerous vicissitudes in which material things close once more around him. But in these moments he has experienced the fact of consciousness. More than this, he has experienced the fact of immortality. He has experienced the fact of God, of totality. And for a few seconds, he has been filled with that infinite love of life and love of God, which cannot be known on the sensory or emotional levels of man's external existence. Therefore, in those moments, his world is placed in order in such an order that it can never again be shaken from that order. And in this, the opinions of others become meaningless. Or his internal faith or knowing, this man may be persecuted and martyred, but he cannot be touched, because he lives in an inward, absolute participation in the fact of divinity. This, then, may be regarded uh, as a negative definition, such as we are capable of fashioning out of the limited materials of ourselves, of this thing which we term consciousness. For consciousness is this wonderful power to actually be the other person, or to be the otherness of God in them. To come to this end, there are certain things that we naturally must attempt to do. All felicity must be deserved by man, for well, this universe is a merit system. Man must therefore come to the condition in which it is possible for him to accept such an experience, to merit it, to justly use it, and to need it, because there is within him already some resources which make it possible, and which will also assist the individual to preserve in honor this light which has been conferred upon him out of the universal abundance. To attain this end, then, Mystic philosophers, scientists of the past, 
and even those of the present, strive gently and unceasingly to achieve the lightness of consciousness so far as it is possible for them to attain it. They would discipline the mind, realizing that by such disciplining they reduce its negative forces and make it more and more like this consciousness which they desire. They feel, these mystics, that if their own natures become like a sanctuary, like a holy and sacred place, a garden of silence in a world of sounds, that if they prepare the temple according to the law, the living God will come and dwell in it. Thus, by purification, redemption of self, regeneration, dedication, and the serious, sincere, and honorable desire to self-improvement, man begins the slow but inevitable journey which will lead him through the mental life into the consciousness which is behind it. He must use first those faculties first available to him. But it is important in all of his philosophizing to recognize uh, that aggressiveness, while it may seem a virtue in this world, is no virtue in terms of consciousness. On the other hand, weakness or negation is not a virtue. That in some way, in order to attain his divinity, man must suspend his humanity. He must in some way end this tyranny of mortality, not only in his body but in his mind. In some strange way, the mystical experience revitalizes or renews the body of man and gives him greater insight and courage. It also renews his entire life in faith, giving him the skill to serve others more effectively because he is less selfish. Perhaps the one thing that the mystical experience uh, tells us more than anything else is that it is the ultimate of spiritual revelation. And that as the ultimate of spiritual revelation, it cannot be communicated. From this we should learn that in our effort to communicate, we may, if we are not careful, overdo to the degree that we overemphasize in others the importance of communication. Certainly. Everyone who wishes to know certain things must be exposed to them, must have some idea about them. Aquinas was problemed with the question, what can a teacher teach? And he answers it in a moderate way, namely that the teacher can teach the individual certain basic principles which will cause that individual to desire to grow of himself and by his own effort. But consciousness cannot be conferred. It must arise within the psychic spiritual life of the individual. Various inducements may assist man uh, to live the life that will make the experience of consciousness likely. But motivation and every other factor must be correct. Therefore, I think we can say that indoctrination for purposes of the development of consciousness will generally prove ineffective. It is far more important that the individual attempt to cultivate vital experience within himself. And vital experience in this case is the dawning awareness through receptivity. On a practical level then, it would seem important to follow the doctrines or the ideas of Lao Tse, or perhaps certain of the teachings of Zen, in the search for the intensification of the experience factor. One reason why we experience so little is because we do not even permit the full penetration of our mental faculties into the things that we are doing. 
From the standpoint, therefore, of the vitalization of our lives, the ancients invented or devised the concept of contemplation, by means of which we devote or dedicate our attention to something with the desire, the simple and natural desire to know and understand that thing better. Always recognizing that a relaxed receptivity to the messages of things cannot but result in increasing sensitivity within ourselves. The individual who can go forth, sit down quietly on the side of the mountain and become receptive to the sunrise or the sunset, can be receptive to the motion of the wind across a field of ripening grain. Perhaps such receptivity uh, enabled Vincent van Gogh to place a strange and luminous color into this field of grain, a color which other men did not see, but a color which Van Gogh, perhaps in his madness, was able to capture on canvas. But certainly, this motion of life in the air in the wheat field can be experienced. It can move in upon man. It can move in with the song of the bird, and the evidence of life. It can come to us through the eyes of those we know and love. It can come in the simple voice and song of children. It can come in the sound of the great cathedral bell. It may come to us in every phase and experience of life if we learn to sit quietly and accept into ourselves the messages of things. If we are able to accept these messages without immediately conditioning them, if we can accept them as we accept air with gratitude, if we can take them as we would water because they are life to us and not ask the name of the land from which the water came, what its beliefs were or what its purpose might be, because this water is our life. If, therefore, we can accept the testimonies of things as a living breath of life moving into us, we can grow. We can find dimensions that are somewhat beyond the mind. We can say to the mind, be still. And in this stillness, we can accept the simple impact of life, the direct, experience of living upon living. And through such experience, a new dimension comes to us, the contemplative dimension of receptivity. Perhaps the mind is still functioning, but it is doing so in a hallowed way. It is simply acting as a messenger. Through the sensory perceptions, it is telling us what we are seeing. It is not interpreting because our will and our purpose and our ego and our desires for the moment rest in sleep. And it is the sleeping of self-purpose that leads to the revelation of divine purpose. In these simple things, by learning to thoroughly examine, we begin to appreciate. For appreciation comes always in the footsteps of thoughtfulness. Things first disliked or neglected, when thoughtfully considered, create in us admiration and respect. The more we understand the workings of the universe as these workings are revealed to us in living things, the more we appreciate both the universe and the cause thereof. Appreciation, then, is a way of sharing. It is not really consciousness but it is on the threshold of consciousness. For appreciation is a warming of ourselves, an opening up and a going forth and rejoicing to the sharing in some happy thought, pleasant contemplation, constructive reflection about things around us. 
If we are able thus to detach ourselves into this aloofness from personal desire and sentiment, there is no knowing, as Lao Tse reveals, but that in some moment thus detached, we shall suddenly sense the opening of a universe of consciousness. We shall suddenly be picked up into this universal mystery of total awareness, total knowing, absolute certainty and validity, about which now we can only have words, and these not too effective. I think psychology must someday recognize this dimension also. But what lies at the root of our need is this need of common consciousness or experience, to be gained only by the overcoming of separateness, as the dividing of our lives from all other lives. All things that are separate must die. All things that are united have a part in eternity, which is a state of union. Consequently, uh, as long as we fight for individuality, we fight for death. We fight for aloneness, isolation, suffering. And we set up situations in which we will have grief and pain and sorrow. Nature allows this because out of grieving, out of pain, out of sorrow, must come the incentives to overcome these things. For without such incentives, man might never even desire the truth, or might certainly never have the courage to place the search for it above every other consideration. But psychology must also realize that behind the mental phenomena of the individual is the universal phenomena of life itself. Mind as we know it is the shadow, the negative pole of consciousness. And the positive pole itself is locked in its own mystery. And whereas man must use the mind to think with, he must ultimately come to the point in which the mind must sacrifice itself for his salvation. This mind is like the ancient patriarch Moses, who was permitted to gaze upon the promised land. But because he had sinned against the laws of God, he was not permitted to enter into Canaan. And this right was withheld from him and bestowed upon Joshua, the son of Nun, who led the children of Israel to the land of milk and honey. Moses is the mind, which from the lonely height of Moab may contemplate the blessedness of truth, but may not enter in. That which can alone enter into this thing is the truth itself. Truth alone can know itself. Man cannot know this truth by any conscious action of his own will, but he can participate in it by simply permitting the spirit in himself to have dominion over the rest. For this spirit, of which he speaks and knows so little, is itself consciousness. It is an indivisible part of total experience. And because man participates in this spiritual fact, he can, by the stillness of his outer life, Restore the luminosity of his internal. Thus reality arises in consciousness becoming aware of him, releasing itself into him. And in this consciousness, as Vivekananda points out, the great joy is that the individual no longer remains himself. Self-purpose ceases because it is meaningless in the beginning. The individual attains all by giving all, attains complete and perfect peace by becoming one with the infinite, and fulfills all desire by permitting universal desire to fulfill itself through the faculties and powers which man has created. Thus, in the mystical experience, eternity takes control of man, his nerves, his muscles, his very body, 
takes control of his mind and his emotions. For the moment, man is eternity. And in that moment, there is impressed upon the fabric of his being a strange and indescribable experience. Later, this fabric cries out to give testimony to it. The mind seeks to explain. The emotions seek to interpret. But in their very explanation and interpretation, they defeat their own objective. For the only record is this strange impact upon the very substance of body itself. This strange, wonderful luminosity which alone bears witness and which cannot be explained except that the body is truly filled with light, a light which is itself filled with love and goodness. These experiences tell us something of a consciousness behind things. And when this consciousness takes hold, then perhaps the mind, among other servants, can bow down before it, and the mind made divine by the life within it may become a wonderful and useful instrument, may go forth to reveal the laws of eternity and the workings of time. Something like this happens in the case of the great composer. For the music which Schubert and Schumann heard within themselves, and which they record as having first realized as moving in the air about them. This music was captured by some dimension of consciousness. It was something that moved in upon them. They neither conjured it nor created it. They created a rapport with universal harmony and sound. And something out of their own psychic nature composed this strange harmony upon an instrument of universal tone. But once this experience was felt, once this strange haunting sound was captured, then the mind took over, reduced it to playable proportions, placed it upon a proper key, set it on paper, and made possible that it could be enlarged into a symphony or whatever the composition required. And out of technique and skill and wisdom, Inspiration was made available in its most perfect form. Thus the personality, the mind, and the emotions become the servants of divine purpose. A man having exchanged the uncertainties of his hopes and fears for the certainties of consciousness impact within himself, then finds his outward life unfolding in reverse. For instead of the outer molding the inner, the inner is molding the outer and expressing through it and releasing into the world those values and powers which we so greatly admire in those illumined souls whose contributions have earned our homage and admiration. In our own way, we must each pass through experiences of this kind, trying to gradually differentiate between consciousness as God, life, light in us, and mind, which is the sum of our own struggle. Mind can help, but consciousness can save. And that which mind divides and wounds, consciousness shall unite and heal. For in all unit consciousness, total life, all good things come into their natural and inevitable works. And all which is divided or imperfect shall vanish away. And the individual, having experienced this, moves triumphantly along the way of life with perfect assurance within himself that he lives in a world of God and truth and light and love and wisdom. These things make his own labors possible and give him the infinite courage to continue according to those principles which he knows to be true.